Good day, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're very excited for the webinar. Uh, as a reminder, if you have questions during the presentation, please chat them into us in the chat box. Um, we are limited to an hour today, so we will try to get to as many questions as possible. And if not, we will try to answer your questions um, personally via email. Um, the, the recording is uh, will be available this afternoon and also the slides. Uh, we'll send out additional email as well to all the attendees today. Our presenter today is Dr. Alex Hristoff, who is a distinguished professor of the dairy nutrition from the Department of Animal Science at the Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Hristoff is a native of Bulgaria, where he started his studies as a research scientist and obtained his PhD in animal nutrition from the Bulgarian Academy of Agricultural Sciences. He's also conducted research at the USDA ARS Dairy Forage Research Center in Madison, Wisconsin, and also the Egg Canada Research Center in Lethbridge, Alberta. He was on the faculty at the Department of Animal and Veterinary Science at University of Idaho and has been at Penn State since 2008. Dr. Herstoff's main interests include protein amino acid nutrition of dairy cattle and migration of nutrition losses and gases emissions from dairy operations. He was very, the very first user of green feed and has used it extensively in his research. He has given over 70 invited presentations and published over 170 books, book chapters, and peer review art journal articles. It is with great honor to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Alex Herstoff. Thank you, Carla, and uh, hope everybody can hear me and see my slides here. Uh, thank you to CWOC for uh, this invitation. We have had a great collaboration during the years, um, and I, I hope that this continues. So what they asked me to talk about today is uh, to cover you know, some of the uh, mitigation work uh, that we have done and generally talk about uh, ways to um, mitigate enteric uh, methane emissions in, in ruminants, not just in dairy cattle, although the title is dairy cattle. We do work only with dairy cows in, here in our department, Penn State. But many of these things that I'll talk about, they apply to beef cattle as well. So with this will start. Uh, Basically, I'll give a little bit of introduction or background on uh, on methane and greenhouse gas emissions, and we'll go through uh, some points uh, in terms of what we are looking at when we do this kind of uh, research. Uh, what these feed additives basically, what kind of criteria they should meet. Uh, we'll, we'll go over some of the mitigation uh, publications that we have done and others have done as well and then we'll conclude this uh, talk. This first slide here shows you, um, again, this is a little background on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and that's in the US. Um, some the most recent uh, EPA data are shown here. And the point I want to make is, uh, in terms of greenhouse gases, total greenhouse gases, livestock are not such a great contributor. Uh, agriculture in the U.S. is, by most recent estimate, makes up about 10% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. And within this, uh, livestock is probably about half, so maybe about 5% of the total greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. are coming from livestock. In terms of methane, though, uh, livestock are obviously a much larger contributor. and um, Enteric fermentation is around 30%, 28-30%. It rivals uh, natural gas and oil uh, industries. When you add manure to the enteric emissions, uh, livestock is uh, really number one contributor of uh, methane uh, emissions in the US. I want to remind everybody, though, that, uh, you know, Ruminants have been on, on this continent and anywhere on Earth for many, many millennia. And uh, we did some uh, analysis back in time out of curiosity to see what the, you know, the, the native uh, ruminants have contributed uh, back in time before we populated uh, North America with cattle. 
this work was published some years ago and what we came up with uh, is depends on the number of uh, bison basically in this country uh this ruminants emitted anywhere from uh, maybe 70 plus percent up to 90 plus percent of uh, the current emissions from livestock in the u.s so just keep that in mind uh, ruminant enteric methane emissions are nothing new on earth uh, i would say and i did say it in uh, in my paper that we basically replaced uh bison with uh, cattle so that's where we are and keep this in mind now wherever you have high animal concentrations uh, you will have high methane emissions this is a paper we published again a couple of years maybe or so ago <clears throat> and those maps show uh, the intensity of uh, methane emissions uh, in the u.s from different sources these are all livestock sources and also uh, combined emissions is on that d uh, graph here so as you see uh, wherever we know that we have ruminants wherever we know that have uh, we have swine like in north carolina there will be uh, high intensive methane emissions in in uh, swine systems those are uh, manure emissions in ruminant systems whether you take uh, you know the california here or um, uh, the midwest wisconsin or the panhandle of texas or southern idaho those will be uh, high density uh, cattle um, environments and this these emissions uh, reflect uh, animal populations there are two types of methane as probably most of you understand this uh, from uh, livestock ruminant systems uh, those are uh, from manure and from enteric fermentation in the in the digestive system of these animals i will have a couple of slides here just to compare beef versus dairy systems so again we are all on the same page uh, with this in beef systems because of the again this is the us who i'm talking about because of the the beef system here in the us the majority of the emissions are in are enteric emissions and they come from the cow calf uh, site of, of the operation um, as i'm going to show you here uh, enteric emissions from uh, feedlot cattle cattle that are affect high grain diets are uh, relatively small of course we have a lot of these but uh, 80 percent people have calculated estimated uh, up to 80 percent of the uh, methane emissions are coming from uh, the cow uh, um, cow calf uh, part of the of the beef system now in dairy system is different uh, probably uh, you, we have about half and half half coming from enteric fermentation have coming from manure management simply because uh, we manage dairy manure differently in in this country and and that applies uh, across the us uh, even small operations um, like in pennsylvania average dairy size is maybe 75 cows or so in the west you have larger operations 500 on average i think uh, 5000 is, is is the common um the uh, size of dairy farm there but in in both systems you will have uh, part of the manure is managed uh, as liquid and that will increase uh, emissions so we are talking about maybe half and half in in dairy systems now because of the sheer number of beef cattle we have in, in the us emissions uh, enteric emissions as you see here uh, from beef cattle are much greater than uh, dairy we have 90 million beef cattle and 9 million dairy cows roughly but when we talk about manure emissions uh, and this includes nitrous oxide here uh, there will be uh, considerably larger emissions from dairy manure than beef manure i'm not going to talk about manure emissions at all but just wanted you know to give some kind of understanding that manure emissions are also very complex Enteric emissions are complex because they relate to feed intake and they relate to animal productivity. That, that's why they are so difficult to manage and, and manipulate. 
But manure emissions are not less complex. There are many, many factors that affect manure methane emissions. I have listed them here, I highlighted them. And uh, some of those are directly related to how we feed the animal. So keep that in mind too. Uh, what comes out of the animal would also affect and determine uh, manure emissions. Uh, but of course, environment is, is critical. Storage time is critical. Uh, when we have done um, a number of on-farm studies, uh, we all, always find that the more um, carbon you have uh, in manure, and the longer that manure is stored under an anaerobic conditions, the higher the methane emissions from that manure are. are. In terms of uh, enteric emissions, enteric methane emissions, I would simply say that number one factor is dry matter intake. DMI here stands for dry matter intake. We have developed through our feed and nutrition network a number of databases uh, where we look at these things and how we can predict uh, or model emissions. And to tell you frankly, in, in most cases, uh, simple equations just uh, based on dry methane intake uh, do as good of a job uh, predicting methane emissions as more complex models uh, where you have in addition um, uh, diet composition. Of course, you cannot have intake of uh, nutrient and then dry methane intake of the same model because those are highly correlated. But there are other things that affect enteric emissions. Animal genetics is one of them I have listed here. I would just talk very briefly about this. Uh, but diet composition, we know that uh, fiber, starch, fat, all these are important factors when it comes to enteric emissions. So in terms of that, uh, here's a, <clears throat> a slide showing uh, one of our uh, estimates of uh, what an average uh, beef cow or a dairy cow or a feedlot animal um, produces in terms of methane uh, yield, which is expressed on, on, a, on a unit of dry methane intake in the US. And as you see, dairy and beef cattle are pretty close. Beef cows will be um, slightly higher just because of the type of feed that they normally uh, consume. Although their dry methane intake is much lower than, than that of a dairy cow, but dairy cows are fed uh, usually, you know, much higher levels of concentrate than beef cows on pasture. And when we get to uh, to feedlot cattle, the emissions, uh, the emission yield is much lower, uh, half or less than a half in some cases here. Uh, because of the type of feed, again, we feed these animals. This is well known, it has been shown many times over the, uh, the, the decades. Uh, when you have high concentrate diets, these cattle are fed 85, 90, some, some cases 95% grain uh, diets. Of course, you will have much lower emissions. <clears throat> Also be aware, because of dry methane intake is such an important factor uh, in terms of methane emissions, uh, emissions increase every time we feed the animal. These are a couple of uh, graphs here showing, uh, you know, different data from our own research and then a, a review paper that we produced a couple of years ago. And as you see, whether we feed the animals once a day, so this graph on the left side is once a day feeding, whether we feed twice a day or whether we feed more than twice a day, every time this animal uh, consumes feed, you will have a peak increase uh, in um, enteric methane emissions. <clears throat> so here's an incomplete list of uh, mitigation strategies. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to go over every single one of them, uh, but, uh, you know, it gives you an idea of the type of uh, uh, strategies that we will be talking about. I have divided them basically into nutritional strategies, so that first part here, and then management strategies. Uh, they are probably even equally important in, in some cases. I will very briefly talk about the management strategies and we'll spend a little more time on the nutritional strategies, improving forage quality, uh, feeding more concentrate feeds, lipids, nitrates, ionophores, uh, some plant extracts, uh, uh, methane inhibitors, you probably have heard or know uh, 
three nitro oxy propanol and I'll work with it. So I'll talk about that. And now there is a commercial name for, for it, uh, Bovera. Seaweeds, I will touch on that. We have done some work. People have done work on that as well. Precision feeding, we don't talk much about this, but uh, I will touch on that as well. Immunization against methanogens, a very complex process, uh, manipulation of the human microbiome, animal genetics, selecting for low uh, methane emission animals, and of course, improving animal health, lifetime productivity of these cows, is, all these things are very important. Animal feed efficiency, improving animal feed efficiency and productivity. Uh, in some si systems, this can be a game changer. Uh, now in developed uh, uh, production systems like in the US or Western Europe or other places, there might not be that much room for improvement, but there is still always room for a little bit of improvement in, in this uh, kind of uh, respect. So here's an example um, that I think makes an important point that improving animal productivity is always a positive uh, uh, development in terms of uh, reducing uh, not just the overall methane emissions, but uh, what we call the intensity of the emissions. And this is expressed on a unit of product, whether it's milk or meat in, in beef cattle. So here are two examples here with the Brazilian um, dairy, dairy system and then the US dairy system. And again, you can go through these numbers. The U.S. produces more methane from dairy cows, from much less animals. But in terms of methane production per unit of milk, uh, the U.S. is about half or less than a half of what uh, a dairy cow will produce in Brazil. So where is this coming from? Obviously, it's coming from the productivity of uh, these dairy animals. And this is my point that anytime you have increased productivity, you will most likely have a decreased intensity of methane emissions. And in many countries around the world, in many regions, there is plenty of room for improving animal productivity. Don't think this is gonna be a simple process. In, in, in many places, probably it's not gonna be even possible but uh, this can be a goal that we, as animal scientists, we work towards to achieve in, in many countries in the world. And, and in the US, we have made a lot of progress on this. I put this data together uh, for uh, something back, back in time, actually it was for the um, Global Research Alliance uh, um, uh, leaflet that uh, they, they published at that time. And it shows how uh, the intensity of the emissions per kilogram of milk have uh, decreased over the years in the U.S. So this is from 1920. Of course, milk production has continuously increased. Uh, dairy uh, cow numbers have continuously decreased. Total milk production have, has increased. And milk production per cow has dramatically increased over the years. And at the same time, you will see a dramatic drop in methane emissions per uh, kilogram of milk in the US and in pretty much any uh, developed um, livestock system. I just want to mention again, I mean, the US is, is a great example of uh, effectiveness uh, and intensive production, but we we are not perfect. Uh, one, one area where I think personally, and many, many people think we can have an improvement is lifetime productivity of these cows. Cows have 2.2 2 maybe lactations. They don't even reach their potential for maximum milk production. So that's one area where we can improve. And if we do that, there will be also uh, an effective reduction in, in methane emissions just because it will, um, on, the, on the heifer side, will have less emissions to produce the same amount of milk. As I said, I will very briefly mention some of those uh, management mitigation practices. Immunization against methanogens is one of those. Uh, this has been around as a very attractive way of uh, cutting methane emissions, has been around for some years now. People have done quite a bit of research. I don't think uh, there are many um, significant successes at this point. These are just 
couple of examples for from uh, recent papers that uh, you can find in the out there. Um, I mean, in this example, there were a large differences in the anti antibody titer of, of uh, these animals, but there was no difference in the methane emissions. One obvious challenge here is that if this kind of kind of intervention uh, uh, has to be a, will will be effective, it has to affect all species methanogen genic species in the rumen. So it's not enough that uh, you just knock out one group or one genus or one species because then the others will uh, probably fill that niche. So it's a challenging uh, approach. Another interesting approach is of course genetic selection. Uh, these are some of our data here from Penn State where we screened animals and ended up with uh, wool and high emitting dairy cows and then you do see quite a quite a bit of difference here between uh, this wool and high emitters whether whether they they are treated with uh, 3NOP as in this case here or whether they are untreated animals you do see some um, spread in in terms of uh, for whatever reason digestibility uh, microbiome uh, or whatever but there is obviously a difference between uh, individual animals. This is an interesting but also challenging approach uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, people have talked about this in, in uh, review papers. Of course, if you are interested, you can go out in the literature and find those. Uh, measurement techniques, how we screen so many cows is one of the big challenges there. Um, are we selecting just for low emitting animals or we are selecting actually for low efficiency? Uh, as well, the, those are all questions that uh, need to be answered. Uh, since I mentioned uh, measurement techniques, we really have to be aware that uh, this is critically important. I have listed here uh, some of those challenges from uh, Chris Reynolds uh, uh, paper um, and presentation that he gave. And then this is uh, all part of our global network project that I think I will mention at some point as well. But there are a number of challenges, particularly when you are trying to screen large number of animals. So be aware, cost is one of them, number of animals that you have to cover, um, accuracy, precision, um, continuous stringent uh, control of uh, the data. Th these are all important points. Since I will be talking about feed additives, I, I want to go over you know, some of the important things that relate to this. And um, I have listed some of these here. We do need independent, controlled, long-term animal experiments to go out and say that this is effective or this is not effective and so on. We can't just have company data uh, to tell us that this is an effective practice or this is not. It has to be independent strictly controlled environment uh, with all the um, protocols in place uh, to, to make a statement like this. We all know that in vitro is not enough. <clears throat> it's a great way to look at uh, initial, initial look at uh, additives or, uh, or techniques uh, to screen this and so on, but that's not enough. We need to have uh, follow-up animal experiments, experiment reliable experimental designs, and there is plenty of literature on this. We did publish a paper on nitrogen recently in Journal of Dairy Science, maybe a year or so ago. I will again encourage you to go and uh, look at the section that talks about experimental design there. In case of dairy, we do need high-producing cows. Um, I'm, I'm very serious about this. Uh, we keep talking about cows that are producing 19, 20 kilos of milk. That is just not relevant to the U.S. dairy industry. Cows that produce 40, 50 kilos of milk versus cows that produce 20 kilos have different requirements, different physiology, passage rate, anything you want. So that, that's critical. Reliable methane measurement techniques. I talked about this already. So that's, that's an important factor here. Proven long-term effect. We, with everything, actually, we still don't have a lot of data on the long-term effect of these uh, mitigation practices. For some, we do uh, 100 plus days, but even this is not long enough. We have, we need long, uh, full lactation trials, several lactation trials to be able to look at animal health, 
uh, to be able to look at reproduction effects and so on. And that's that's not happening because of funding, because of uh, facility limitations and so on. But without this, we won't be making much progress. And no side effects, of course. Uh, dry mat intake, um, animal health, milk quality, uh, productivity and reproduction. All this have to be uh, monitored and, and they have to be within these long-term um, trials. And repeatability. That again has to i have to emphasize this it's not enough that we have one positive trial here or there it has to be repeated at several locations it has to be repeated by different teams why i'm saying all this and i'm using this example but i have nothing against the mutra or nothing against these companies out there companies that have a product that they think will mitigate methane they do need strict well controlled independent studies to prove their point. Uh, Mutrao is just one example. Uh, if you go to their website, you will see a 38% reduction uh, claim uh, that depends on animal breed, age, farm conditions and feed reg regime. And I don't know how that relates here anyway, but 38% is a big number. When, uh, when, if you try to look the literature, where is, you know, this coming from and what's the support for this kind of claim, uh, I could find only two papers at least. One was a Rusitec study that really doesn't count, extremely high doses. Another one was a beef trial. Uh, I think it was done at UC Davis. Overall, no effect of Mutral uh, on um, uh, methane yield. Seems like at the last stage of the experiment, there was a significant effect here, as it's shown in that, that uh, small graph. But overall, there is no effect, so certainly not a 38% reduction. Uh, that, that was my point. Uh, you know, we have to be, as industry, as scientists, we have to be really uh, vigilant about um, these kind of claims. So most of the things that I'm going to talk about, they come from our reports. Uh, we, we produced uh, an FAO paper back in time. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, review articles published not just us many uh, review papers have been published in the last at least 10 years so if you are interested this is all out there already published not just from us from many different groups around the world so there is a lot of things written on uh, mitigation of enteric methane this is another example of a paper in a, in a high impact journal uh, where we try to predict uh, what will be the impact of different practices and their economic feasibility and you will see here, for example, carbon sequestration is certainly one of the um, promising approaches if you want to improve feed digestibility, uh, use of feed additives and all kinds of things here that are listed. In, in all this, again, the message that we really uh, are missing trials or don't have sufficient number of uh, experiments with high producing animals and long term experiments. So I'll go through uh, some of these mitigation practices and they all pretty much are published. They are known out there, but just to bring your attention to, to this as well. Forage quality is, is one of the, the important ones. We talk about improving uh, the emission intensity uh, by improving digestibility of the forages, the quality of the forages, quality of the silage, silage preservation, inoculants all these things can make a difference on the production side and that will make a difference on the intensity of the emission c3 versus c4 grasses uh, corn silage versus grass silage legumes versus grass silage and so on all these things have been looked into and there is some data to support one or the other uh, high sugar content grasses for example is is another one here and pretty much anything that improves silage digestibility is expected to improve, uh, to decrease uh, methane intensity, the emissions of um, uh, methane intensity emissions. Another one is feeding more grain, feeding more concentrates. And we all know this. I showed you the, the feedlot uh, uh, data, uh, feedlot cattle data. Obviously, you know, when you have starch digestion versus NDF digestion in the room and you will have uh, different uh, level of emissions. So here's an example from uh, the inner work uh, that I'm using just to show you that. And going back to our own research here, we have done 
uh, some work with uh, a high amylase corn silage hybrid, Anogen, um, you may have heard of it. And, and the point here I want to show you is that we did see a decrease in the emission intensity. Uh, we didn't see any effect on methane itself, uh, daily emissions, but because cows produced four and a half pounds more milk, uh, when you calculate this on a, on a milk basis, there was about 7% reduction in methane intensity. Not a significant reduction in uh, energy corrected milk intensity. There was a trend there, but a significant reduction in, in milk, uh, in the intensity based on the uh, fluid milk. Lipids. Lipids, people have tested and talked about lipids for many years now, and we all know that lipids will have this effect, uh, methane mitigation effect. We really do have to be careful with ruminants, particularly dairy cow, because that's where we feed lipids exclusively, uh, because unsaturated fat, as we all know, can affect rumen fermentation, and we can have side effects, like in terms of uh, milk fat. Uh, milk protein also can be affected negatively uh, um, with uh, too much fat and too much uh, unsaturated fat. But overall, we do know that uh, inclusion of uh, fat within the limits that doesn't affect too much uh, negatively rumen fermentation, and we are talking in dairy cows no more than 6% in my book, uh, can have an impact uh, by up to 20% reduction on, on methane emissions. Tannins and saponins, these plant-based products, again, have been looked up um, by many, many uh, studies and researchers around the world. Uh, some promising data are out there, and I have even seen a long-term study, uh, I think from Switzerland, that that, had, that was a positive one, and, and we have seen a reduction in, in methane with uh, tannins particularly. That's a very large category, though, tannins and saponins, um, so there is a huge number of compounds out there but some of them uh, may be promising and may be effective. And uh, I will make this uh, point here too, in, in grazing systems, that may be an option, an effective option for, for uh, decreasing enteric emissions. These opponents uh, just made a point here that we have not seen any confirmation of, of these effects, although there are some reports in the literature. Essential oils, a lot of groups have worked on that. Um, I will summarize this in one sentence. I don't think at this point we have uh, too many effective uh, uh, com compounds or products out there. Uh, at least in the literature, you don't see this much, but there might be something that works. Here's an example from our own work here, uh, some unpublished data that we recently produced with uh, this kind of uh, extract, plant extract based product. And we did, we did see a reduction significant reduction in both methane and um, methane yield. We, we are following up on that uh, just to make sure that uh, it, it is true because I was surprised myself that we have seen this kind of effect and it a uh, pretty pretty stable effect. It's a linear effect here because this is a, this was a dose response study. So you know, there may be something out there that works. Uh, the Mutrao is another example. You know, if the Mutrao people produce enough papers that show this mitigation effect. Here is another plant-based product that may be actually effective. We have also looked at ways of decreasing methane by knocking out protozoa, and that, that's a very old concept. It is based on the fact that um, I think up to 40% of the methanogens seem to be associated with uh, rumen protozoa. So if you somehow knock protozoa out, you may be affecting methane emissions. I don't think this has been a very successful strategy at this point, so um, I, I won't talk too much about it, uh, but people are working on it. And nitrates. Now there is plenty of studies out there that have shown, including meta-analysis, uh, that have shown nitrates are effective. So you are, uh, if you are brave enough and you want to feed nitrates to, to your animals, uh, and if you are a producer, of course, I'm not talking about research, uh, then that may be uh, a mitigation practice out there. Seems like 14 to 16 percent reduction on average. I, I won't, uh, of course, uh, not comment on that because it's a risky uh, uh, practice. 
Um, there is an adaptation, but there is also a reverse adaptation. So you, you, you have to be careful, of course, if you are trying this kind of uh, technology. Iono force really have not shown much uh, promise. Uh, Meta-analysis have shown uh, up to 40% reduction in, in beef cattle, but not in dairy. In dairy, there is no significant effect. Improving feed efficiency seems to be the, the main um, mechanism here. Precision feeding. We don't talk much about precision feeding, but uh, in my opinion, that may be something we should be looking into uh, in the future. And I'm sure people are looking into it right now. Uh, if we try to meet individual animal requirements versus a group uh, of animals, because that's how we feed dairy cows, and not just dairy, but beef as well. We feed 200, 500 cows uh, on average, and some we overfeed, some we underfeed probably. So somehow, if we can do this and feed those animals based on their daily requirements, maybe there might be uh, some effective uh, reduction of uh, methane emissions. I will talk a little bit about our uh, inhibitor work. And uh, we have done a lot of work here with three nitro uh, oxypropanol in the, in the US, in, in the dairy. Uh, I think pretty much we're the only ones that have done this work. Um, apologies if I'm missing something. But we have seen consistent reduction in methane up to 30% reduction over 100 plus days studies. Uh, the effect is reversible and it's immediate. I want to point this out. Um, we, when we switch treatments, we immediately see a reduction in, um, in methane in the control group and the reverse uh, increase in methane in the 3-NOP group uh, within a one week of time. So uh, the compound uh, <clears throat> has to be present in the rumen all the time to be effective. And as soon as you pull it out of the room, you won't see an effect. Uh, here's uh, another study that we have done looking at um, um, diurnal um, um, effect of 3-NOP. So the, the blue line here is the 3-NOP treatment and the control is the yellow line. So this is a freestyle study. Uh, we had, I don't know, maybe 24,000 measurements in this particular one. And as you see, Cows here are fed around this point. Uh, this is 10, 10 hour uh, in that scale of 25 hours here. So immediately before feeding, absolutely no effect of 3NOP. Why? Because it's metabolized very quickly in the rumen. And if the cow doesn't take it with the feed continuously and cows don't eat much before they go for the morning milking and until they are fed the new feed, uh, the effect basically disappears. So in these two time points, there was absolutely no effect of 3NOP. But when we go to the points after feeding, you see the dramatic drop in emissions, up to 40% actually reduction. So overall, 24-hour, uh, uh, we have again this 25-30% reduction. You will always see increase in hydrogen. That's typical. Many have seen it, and with not just with 3NOP, with any inhibitor. We also see a linear increase in dissolved hydrogen, so not just hydrogen emissions. Uh, we see the typical uh, changes in uh, VFA profile that you would expect. I will point one thing though, we clearly see, con uh, consistently see an effect on butyrate. We don't always see an effect on propionate, although in this particular study there was a significant increase in propionate, significant decrease in acetate, but in all the studies that we have done with 3NOP and are now with the, um, with the seaweeds that uh, have an inhibitory effect, we do see an increase in butyrate. So we have discussed this in our papers. Again, if you are interested, you can find it there. Uh, we did some kind of a meta-analysis with all the data that we produced with the 3NOP. So on average, we see a 25% reduction in daily emissions. 25% uh, reduction in emission yield, and we also 29% uh, reduction in uh, emission intensity based on an energy corrected milk. Interestingly enough, uh, we did see a, a significant increase in um, milk fat percent. This, I would think, is a good news for everybody, including the dairy industry, because if this comes around and uh, farmers, dairymen start using it, 
uh, they, they have to have some basis, of course, uh, some incentives to use it. And uh, that increase in milk fat will be a good incentive if it confirmed um, other than our studies. <clears throat> I will talk very briefly about our seaweed sea work. I see that time is, is flying, so I may have to skip some of the remaining slides, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll get there and we'll leave some uh, que uh, time for questions. We have done a lot of screening here in the last couple of years, I don't know, 100 plus, 120 species. And really we have only found a few that uh, have some um, moderate decrease in methane uh, yield. This is all per uh, grams of uh, TMR dry matter. Really the only one that we have seen uh, to cut out emissions dramatically as others have obviously reported is Asparagopsis. We have worked with Asparagopsis taxiformis only here, and we do see a dramatic reduction in methane up to down to 80%. It that that affects it, it does affect uh, dry methane intake, though it's not palatable uh, mostly, and it has a very high ash content. So with 0.75% um, inclusion, we did see a, a uh, significant drop in 20% uh, in dry methane intake and significant drop in milk production. At 0.5%, uh, the, the effect is not um, statistically significant, although in a follow-up study we, we did see, that I'm not showing here, we did see a decrease also in dry methane intake at the 0.5% level. Others don't seem to, be, to uh, have this kind of problem. Uh, I think there was a paper recently from UC Davis where they didn't see an effect on dry matte intake. In our case, with our cows, even at 0.5%, we see a drop in dry matte intake. Hydrogen followed the same kind of pattern as with 3NOP. In my opinion, there are still a lot of problems with seaweeds before we can uh, go out and uh, start recommending this practice. Of course, we cannot recommend it until those seaweeds are uh, start growing commercially in some kind of uh, aquaculture condition uh, that they can pr be producing substantial am amounts. But even if that's not a problem, then we still have a lot of concerns with uh, other side effects as I have listed them here. Uh, bromoforms, which are the active compounds in those red seaweeds, uh, they don't seem to be very stable. So how you process the seaweed, how it is stored, we have seen this in our own papers, uh, our own research, we have a paper now in Journal of Dairy Science that uh, is under review and uh, shows this kind of decrease in bromoforms over time. Adaptation, um, feasibility in terms of cost, of course, that's a big thing here. Uh, Long-term production effects, reproduction effects. We have no idea how this is gonna play out. Um, milk quality, I will show you some data here that we do have a concern with milk quality. Although we did a panel, we did a panel with 100 20 um, people, I think it was 120, they did not find a significant difference in uh, milk taste between uh, cow, milk from cows, fat, uh, asparagopsis, taxiformis, and control cows. But the margins are were very close. So, you know, I'm not sure that there is no difference uh, in, uh, in milk taste, organoleptic uh, qualities of milk. Um, when I say iodine and bromoform, here is our data uh, that are still not uh, officially published, but we, we did see a dramatic increase in iodine, milk uh, iodine concentration, and also bromide concentration with uh, feeding asparagopsis. So I had the intention to go through, um, Claudia is, um, uh, was a postdoc working with, with us uh, with a global network project on on probably what is I consider the most comprehensive meta-analysis in terms of mitigation strategies. She presented this at the ADSA uh, this last summer. I probably won't have time to go through all this and maybe I will jump just to the conclusions, but uh, we'll, we'll go through some of the slides just so you understand the, the scope of this project. So this is a large team, international team of contributors uh, who worked on, on this project. Some of them are listed here. Um, again, I'm not going to have time to spend on this. Just want to mention that we have follow-up projects now with uh, in uh, Latin America. Uh, we have a postdoc in Colombia working, AgroSavia working on this. 
uh, right now. And then we also have a follow-up project in Southeast Asia. So we are targeting regions that don't have much uh, data and information on um, methane emissions from ruminants in these particular regions. So we have developed the databases for two, these two regions. The Southeast Asia one is about 1,000 individual animal observations, and uh, South America is 2,700. Our idea with this is to do a meta-analysis of uh, everything that is out there published in the last decades, but specifically pay attention to effect on animal performance and uh, NDF digestibility was part of this animal performance. So we don't have uh, unacceptable trade-offs uh, when you have uh, reduction in methane emissions. A large data set, as I said, uh, probably the most comprehensive one, 650 studies. We ended up using 400 plus studies and included also cattle and small ruminants. I will skip through this. Uh, we, we looked at a lot of mitigation uh, categories. So some of them are listed here. The paper is, is, is done. Uh, it is submitted to journals now. We, we are trying to find the best journal to publish it. Uh, so look for it if you are interested in the future. Uh, this is some background on the data. Interestingly enough, half of the strategies that we looked at, or over half of the strategies, did not have an effect on methane emissions. So again, that uh, that is to tell you that not everything that is out there actually uh, works. Many of the papers were missing important information. So these black parts of those bars here means no data. So in terms of uh, methane intensity on a, on a beef animal, on an uh, average daily gain basis, 80%, 80 plus percent of the studies didn't publish. <clears throat> didn't have that information to publish it. Uh, with milk, the same thing. Half of the dairy studies didn't have that information. So this is, I think, an important slide uh, that summarizes the practices that we found to be most effective. And they are listed here on this side. Methane inhibitors, oil and fats, oil seeds, electron sinks, nitrates, and toniferous forages. So nothing new, right? What I, we've been telling you back uh, with a few slides ago is, is again here. It's nothing new, but now we have a very solid basis to say that these are recommended practices when uh, production is not affected. There are also some, some product-based practices that were proven to be effective, and all this is significant. And we have also listed the, the size of the effect, anywhere from 10, 20, up to 30% reduction. Uh, those product-based uh, interventions are a decrease dietary forage to concentrate ratio. Again, nothing new uh, that I have already talked about, increasing feeding level, decreasing grass maturity, and so on. Some of these practices may have a negative effect on production, as this is shown here, oils and fats, may decrease intake, may decrease NDF digestibility. So we have to be aware of those side effects and those uh, undesirable effects of those practices. These are the conclusions from Claudia's study, so I, I'm going to skip that. I will try to provide you with the slides, but be aware that I'm going to take the slides out that are not published. So work that is not published, I'm not going to show you. Uh, this is our conclusion. I'm not going to read all this. I will just say that we have to be very vigilant about the type of data that are out there, where are they coming from, how, how were they produced, and whether uh, these things are confirmed in at different places in, in, in several studies. And so far, I have nothing else to recommend than uh, in terms of uh, feed additive uh, other than uh, 3NOP. 3NOP seems to be the only effective practice, at least at this point. I'm sure there will be others uh, coming along, but uh, at this point, that's the only one I can consider effective. So with this, we'll leave some time for questions. Uh, should I uh, stop sharing my screen, uh, guys? See you all, guys. Uh, I think you can actually just leave that slide up, and if okay, uh, somebody we'll if slide. somebody refers yeah. to a specific slide, that way we can jump through it. 
All right. Uh, we only have about by five minutes. By the way, this shows our uh, setup in um, one of our intensive uh, facilities where we measure methane using green feed and also we measure it in this particular case using SF6 at the same time. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, all right, and yeah, that photo actually looks familiar to me. I've been there a couple times. Yeah. All right, we, we have about five or six questions here, um, but more might come in. So the first question is, hi, Alex, great presentation. Could you uh, could the feeding of nitrates result in increased nitrogen output from ruminants? Okay, good question. <laughs> I, I actually had a, a slide where I was gonna show some work from Denmark uh, where they found a slight increase, if I remember correctly, of nitrous oxide emissions from the rumen. Uh, usually you don't have this kind of emissions from coming from the rumen, but they did see uh, an increase in nitrous oxide emissions, which again, if I remember correctly, they were talking uh, about offsetting uh, the methane effect by, by maybe 10% or so. So that, that's a one thing that may happen. Um, Nitrogen, uh, in terms of uh, urinary excretions and, and total manure excretions, I don't know if that's significantly increased, but I know I think uh, ammonia in the rumen increases, so there might be some effect on uh, urinary nitrogen excretion. I have to go back to the literature and check this. I'm not 100% sure. Alrighty, thanks for that. Uh, next question comes in, and you did touch on this, but I just want to make sure we covered everything. Um, there are a lot of people talking about LJ from Bromoform has been around for many years, but everybody knows it's not safe and carcinogenic. So what's the trick with LJ? Yeah, <laughs> good, good point again. We do know it's uh, carcinogenic. I actually was not able to find any any convincing evidence or any regulations against bromoform in terms of uh, cancer. But I know it's an ozone depleting compound, so it's banned because of the ozone. And there are some uh, indications that may be also, may be also carcinogenic. Uh, what's the attraction with uh, seaweeds? Uh, I think it's just because uh, it's a natural product and natural way to uh, cut emissions. Uh, bromoform by itself, I don't think it will be ever viable alternative in terms of synthetic molecule feeding bromoform, but uh, as if you offer it as a seaweed, uh, then the acceptance from the public may be a little different. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, next question, and we're getting a whole lot of uh, questions, but we won't, won't be able to get to all of them, but we will get them answered um, uh, after the, the I'll webinar. be more than happy to, to go through these questions when we finish later. Okay, okay. so next question, uh, regarding the increase in hydrogen emissions using 3NOP and the green feed system, is it relevant to say using the green feed system uh, an increase in hydrogen emissions is an indication of an increase in feed intake. Sorry, do you need me to read that again? Mm, I don't know if this is uh, kind of relevant. We we don't use green feed. Okay, you may be talking about pasture conditions. Uh, we don't use green feed to measure intake, obviously, in our situation. Um, we measure intake either as you see here in this kind of facility or we have K1 gates where we measure intake. So we know that 3NOP, at this point we know 3NOP, we had some concerns, but now we know that it doesn't affect dry matter intake. We did see in one study decrease by 3NOP in dry matter intake, but when we expressed it on a, a cow body weight uh, basis, there was no significant effect. So uh, at this point, I can say that we don't see an effect of the NOP on dry matter intake. The hydrogen question here, uh, whether you use green feed or use anything else, hydrogen emissions as hydrogen gas will increase when you have uh, inhibited methane uh, production in the rumen. The increase is small. We are talking from zero maybe to one, two, three grams per day per cow, uh, but that that's there and it is, um, a proxy, maybe, if you want, for the changes in dissolved hydrogen that happened in the rumen. 
So I don't know if this answers exactly your question, but that's that's my stand on this. Okay, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. So um, the next one is, in your view, a reduction of say 25% in net methane emissions in cows could lead to an increase in milk yield of which order of magnitude in liters? Yeah, that, that question, I don't think it's uh, um, properly asked. Reduction in methane emissions will not result in increased milk yield. Uh, at least we don't see that in, in our studies, and we see consistently a reduction in methane, but actually we have not seen any changes in milk yield. We did see that slight increase in milk fat percent. Maybe where this person coming from is uh, methane is an energy drain. Uh, we consider it an energy drain. So maybe by saving some of that energy, cows will produce more milk. I don't think anybody has been able so far to show this kind of uh, effects consistently. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, we do have a lot of praise saying thanks for the presentation. It was excellent. Um, and then the final question we'll ask um, live here is, um, how important is it that the additive is fed mixed continuously through the feed? If we are talking about 3NOP, it's absolutely important. As I showed in one of the, our studies, if you stop feeding it, if the cows stop taking 3NOP with the feed, obviously, um, the effect will disappear immediately. Before feeding, we had zero effect. Uh, I think it was two hours before feeding and four hours before feeding, we had no effect at all, just because the cows eat less or don't eat enough um, before they are milked and before they are fed in the morning. So it's absolutely critical for 3NOP to continuously enter the rumen, one way or another. People are talking about capsules, slow release capsules, and that kind of stuff, but it has to be uh, entering the rumen on a continuous basis. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, the remaining questions, we'll make sure to have Dr. Herstoff answer them and uh, we'll reply to each of you individually. Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, it was great and thank you Seawalk for organizing it. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Alex. As Mike yeah. mentioned, we are trying to field these questions as best as possible. Um, I do have a category here of everybody that has put a question in, and we'll get to those as soon as possible, and also reach out to Dr. Herstoff um, as well this afternoon to see if we can get those out. Um, as a reminder, it has been recorded. Um, we will get slides in the recording out. Uh, within 24 hours is usually our turnaround time and uh, be prepared to see that email as well. If you guys have any further questions for us in the meantime, if you didn't get a chance to chat in, um, go ahead and email us at contact at c-lockinc.com. Thank you guys for attending and um, we look forward to our next webinar. I believe December we are going to take a break from webinars and we will resume webinars uh, monthly starting in January. So thank you guys and have a wonderful day. Stay safe and healthy.